Welcome back. President Trump calls it a working vacation, but he has certainly been busy. On Saturday, he blamed the violence and death of a young woman protesting Nazis and white supremacists in Charlottesville. On many sides, on Monday, he finally called out the Klan and other hate groups, but on Tuesday, he claimed there were fine people on both sides there. Forensic investigators, by the way, are still looking to find anyone among the white supremacists, white nationalists, neo-Confederates, neo-Nazis, and militias who qualify as one of the fine people there. On Wednesday, President Trump was forced to dissolve several high-profile executive councils after the high-profile CEOs on them quit in protest. The Joint Chiefs of Staff all released statements saying they won't tolerate bigotry and racism in the military. The Republican chairman of the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee questioned the president's stability and competence. And today, President Trump fired Steve Bannon. Joining us for more is Christian Ziegler, Sarasota Republican State Committee man, Susan Nylon of the Nylon Report. And we welcome Jacob Ogles, senior editor of SRQ Magazine. Welcome to the Trapezoid. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you know, Christian, uh, no surprise, I want to start with you. Oh. Fantastic. I'm excited uh, for the doom and gloom. <laughs> There, there's one tweet from Saturday that I really want your reaction to. Um, the tweet goes like this. There is reason why our greatest generation kicked their ass in World War II. No room in America for racist and loser Nazis. That's by Christian Ziegler, <laughs> state committee man for Sarasota <laughs> County. I need to watch language maybe next time. <laughs> yeah, really. You know, I mean, re in reality, there was more passion and moral outrage in that quote than anything I saw from the president this week? Well, uh, the, yes, um, but I will tell you that the president did start off with on Saturday, he, de he denounced both sides. Now, it's easy, it's Friday now, it's easy to play, you know, what they call Monday morning quarterback, days after the event, looking back, reflecting, looking at the facts. We have more of the facts than we did on Saturday afternoon. Um, so I think that the president did a good job right away denouncing both sides, saying this violence is, there's no place in America for it. Um, the media and, and members of the left, that wasn't good enough, and they came out and they highly criticized him, said, well, he didn't specifically denounce these groups, and then he comes out Monday and does it, and then all of a sudden it's, well, it's too late. And I think it's a bit hypocritical because when terrorist attacks happen and, and other events like that, you do not see that the media going to the Democratic Party and Democratic members of Congress and Democratic president at the time asking them to denounce every single group on the other side. So it's a little hypocritical. I think the president did a good job denouncing both sides. He did eventually come out and say, well, these are the groups that were involved. Shame on them. And really, Nazis, I, what I said in that tweet, I honestly believe. My grandmother was in a concentration camp. Um, her sister passed away in one um, over in Yugoslavia. They were working on them. Um, I think Nazis, they lost on a world stage. And I don't support them. I don't think they have any place. But they do have a right to assemble if they want to assemble and spew their hate. Um, but I think that it's disgusting. And I don't think anyone on the Republican Party side would ever support Nazism. Susan? <laughs> he said so much. Um, <laughs> it's OK. I don't know what to respond. Uh, let me remind the words of Benghazi when President Obama waited 24 hours or tried to wait 24 hours to come out after he gathered all the information. He was pummeled with the fact that he didn't come out immediately and declare it a terrorist attack. And he was crucified long after that because what he said was not completely accurate. So let's not talk about hypocrisy because you get it on both sides. Um, however, he didn't just come out and say, I denounce them. He took it right back, like with an hour later, with a series of tweets basically un unraveling what he had already said. And a lot of people doubted his sincerity. Well, but when you well, look at that event, for example, I mean, you know, you had both sides. You had the Nazis, obviously, they want to hijack some rally that was going on that wasn't really for them, but they went and started promoting it. But then you had Antifa, and these guys show up in mass. They show up with baseball yeah, bats. They didn't kill so, well, okay, Jacob. I mean, how quickly could that have changed? They were throwing rocks into the crowd. People were coming out with their head bleeding with open wounds. Anyone at that point could have suffered shock, and someone would have died. But yes, I agree with you. They didn't kill anyone. But I mean, that's that individual that killed. He's the one that needs to be responsible because we need more individual responsibility focused on. Sure, he should be criminally held responsible. But I have a real trouble imagining a politician that qualifies as a statesman who would look at Antifa violence and then come out and say, well, there's probably good people hanging out with Antifa as well. And that's the problem. And what really got me about Trump, I mean, I think an important thing about this is the evolution of the story. 
yes, Trump was getting beat up for his first comments not going far enough. And then he came back and he really loudly denounced the white supremacists and the neo-Nazis. But then, you know, he decided to bring the whole story back to life unprompted the next day. All right, we are just getting started with this conversation. <laughs> and we'll have much more on President Trump's tough week right after we get a check on First Alert Weather. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Republican-controlled Senate rejected repealing and replacing Obamacare last, night, last month. A contentious battle about raising the debt ceiling and possible government shutdown is next month. Yet this week is being described as the president's worst week in office. Does our panel agree? And joining us for more is Christian Ziegler, Sarasota the Republican State Committee man, Susan Nylon of the Nylon Report, and we welcome Jacob Ogles, of, senior editor of SRQ Magazine. Some of the most ferocious reaction this week uh, about how the president handled what happened in Charlottesville has been from Republicans itself, including uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Bob Corker, who was considered at one point uh, as Secretary of State. Let's take a look at what he said. I do think there need to be some radical changes. The president has not yet um, has not yet been able to demonstrate the stability uh, nor some of the competence that he needs to demonstrate in order to be successful. We uh, you know, it would not be unusual for a Republican to take a shot at a Democrat president saying that or a Democrat taking a shot at a Republican uh, se uh, president. But Christian, this was a senior Republican senator questioning the president's stability and competence. Mm -hmm. You say what? Uh, I say that there's no doubt that there is a little bit of a hesitation, if you will, a little bit might be a soft term to use, uh, between um, whether it's Republican senators, Republican congressmen, and the president. Now, Donald Trump, when he ran, he ran against the system, he ran against the establishment, and he ran against Washington, D.C. And you look at that in D.C., I think popular vote, he got about 4% of the popular vote inside Washington, D.C. So there's no doubt that inside the system, people on the Hill as well, they do not agree with the president on some issues. Um, I think the president's put his head down. He's accomplished a lot that doesn't get covered because, you know, people want to talk tweets. People want to talk, you know, this thing that happened in Charlottesville, which is horrible. Um, but that really kind of overshadows what he's doing, and we're not really diving into that. But right. he is accomplishing a lot. But he has not accomplished next to anything legislatively. He has not repealed and replaced Obamacare. He has uh, not yet passed tax reform or infrastructure. And the question is, how do, do you do that if you don't even have the support and the backing of your own party in, in the Senate? Well, see, even the way you phrase that question is putting the burden on Donald Trump to pass bills. I mean, in 2010, when we ran for the House and Republicans said, give us control of the House, we will repeal Obamacare. Then in 2014, they said, give us the Senate, and we're going to repeal Obamacare. And then in 2016, let's have the White House, and we're going to repeal, repeal Obamacare. And the Senate couldn't get it done. So, you know, it's one thing, like, the way the media and people that disagree with Donald Trump, they try to pin it on him and say, why didn't the repeal Obamacare, you know, the repeal Obamacare get done? And really, you have to look at these senators, these hundred senators that are sitting there, they're casting that vote. They're the ones responsible for Obamacare not getting repealed. Susan? Yeah, except the fact that he promised that he would get it done within the first 100 days. That was his campaign promise the entire he's, time. He's still going to get it done, but he's got to put pressure on these guys. He's going to continue the except pressure. Except I yeah. would say that there's a large, it's a large responsibility to him because he didn't actually include anyone. When you come into office and all you do are executive orders and you basically override Congress, you're not making a lot of friends. He's, you're not giving an opportunity to actually work with the people who to wanted the, to work with you. He's got the backing of the American Jason, people, yeah. and that should well, be all that he needs. To, to be no. Well, I don't know when that came in. <laughs> but to be fair, I think that whenever you have one of the, these folks that moves from the private sector directly into an executive mm -hmm. position in government, yep. there's always going to be a period where the relationship between legislators and the executive is going to be difficult. I think we saw that the first couple years of Rick Scott's administration. Absolutely. He had a really rough relationship with lawmakers. That did improve over time, although it's still not as strong as it, prob it, as it ever was under a Jeb Bush or Charlie Crist or somebody that had been more involved in the public but, but sector. But I will point out, even when the relationship between Rick Scott and state legislators was not great, he was not tweeting well, 
uh, well, and attacking them in the most personal ways. This guy ways. creates his own narrative problems. Exactly. There's no doubt about that. And from a PR standpoint, there is no way. I mean, that's been one of the greatest problems with this White House is they could never control the he story. He undermines every piece of authority that he ever gives himself. I, I think that the president, you know, I will tell you where the president, um, uh, I think he underestimated just how deep this swamp is. Um, he came in. There's a lot of people inside the government that want to take him out that are still working inside the government. It's hard to see who they are, right? We have all these leaks. He's suffering leak after leak after leak. This is unprecedented. He leaks and, a lot of it himself. But, but that's because there's people, these career bureaucrats, that are threatened by him, shaking up the system. But I'll tell you, meanwhile, you know, everyone talks about tweets, oh, shame on him. That, he won the campaign. He was tweeting like this. What happens is, is behind the scenes, he gets over a million jobs created, stock markets at the highest, manufacturing optimism's well, at the so. highest. So he's accomplishing stuff behind the scenes well, the that people actually jobs. care about. Okay, well. let's let's get, <laughs> get for a moment back to Charlottesville. In, in terms of how Republicans and Democrats, the general public in general, is reacting to what the president said. According to a new CBS News poll, uh, it finds that 55% of Americans disapprove of the way the president reacted to the violence uh, in Charlottesville. But... 67% of Republicans approve of his response. What sense do you get here on the Sun Coast about how the public is viewing this? Yeah, and you know, I even saw a CNN poll today that showed 60% said they'd support Trump no matter what he does. So 60% of who? Well, of Trump supporters. Oh. Um, okay. Now, I, I think on the Sun Coast, and and I do think we have sort of a split between a very conservative level of Republicans and more moderate, more mm -hmm. business-minded Republicans here on the Gulf Coast. I think that's always been the case. But the thing is, I don't think they're jettisoning Trump right now. I will say that I think his support is still there. The question is when, when there's another option that is a Republican option, how will he be able to keep his base together then? Mm -hmm. I think he's probably going to see a primary challenge in four years, though that's going to depend a lot on what happens in the midterms. Uh, Christian, the, the sense I get by talking to Republicans around here is that there are at least two camps, maybe more. Some of them, uh, really good, hardworking uh, Republicans who have been involved in the party for many years, are really uncomfortable with what's been happening with this president and what he says and how he reacted to Charlottesville. Um, but they're not going to say so. And then you have other Republicans like yourself uh, who remain uh, loyal, uh, outspoken, and, you know, have his back. There's always that percentage of Republicans that, um, you know, they have concerns, whether it's Rick Scott or whether it's Fern Buchanan or, or Donald Trump that, you know, oh, are they too conservative, right? Um, so there's always that percentage. And sometimes they're loud and they like to get it out there. I mean, I'll tell you, from, from my perspective, when you look at the grassroots, everything that's going on, like the media and the left and everyone going after Trump, it's solidified support for the president because we feel like we've been attacked for years. Now he's getting attacked. He's one of us. So we're all bunkering down. And I'll tell you, like even, for example, the poll that you referenced there, and it was about his response. Well, one poll that you haven't brought up yet are removing these Confederate monuments, which I'm not like a big Confederate fan or anything. I mean, I grew up in the South, born in the North. I'm not like a Confederate sympathizer. but 62% of Americans, that's all Americans, 62% say don't remove them, leave them. And, I mean, that's a poll that shows that the American people, they think it's silly, really, what the other side's bringing up, but they're getting all the media attention. And from my side and other Trump supporters, we say typical media, typical left, focusing on stuff that's just simply not true. Well, these I, I, I got to tell you, though, you keep saying that it's media and it's the left. There's a lot of Republicans out there, a lot of Republicans who have been critical and have stood up against uh, Donald Trump. Mitt Romney today uh, again, came out and the said... The establishment, yes. So there's okay, that percentage of the let's, establishment. But let's, let's keep that in perspective, that it's not just the left and it's not just media. It's a lot of people who are really questioning, yes, great, the establishment. Now we've separated the establishment from the Republican Party. But that's not the point. And I got to once again say... Trump is his own problem. He does more media on himself than anybody. He has Trump TV now that's 24-7 right. Trump. I want to get to one more uh, issue uh, while we have it, and that is at least we could start talking about Steve Bannon, uh, who has really been, uh, I don't know if everybody knows who Steve Bannon is. He's uh, a Sarasota guy. He's a Sarasota <laughs> for about five was, minutes, I would was say. Was a Sarasota guy. Uh, you know, Jake, what, do you, what, what sense do you get in terms of, of now that Steve Bannon is, is out of the White House? 
Well, you're seeing some immediate reaction when you jump on Breitbart and some of the more nationalist-leaning sites that are reacting very negatively to this news. That said, where are they going to go? That reminds me of when Jesse Jackson would get really mad at Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Come convention time, he was giving a speech in favor of Bill Clinton. He's got nowhere to go. Uh, that's the problem with the nationalists. I mean, this is as much power as the nationalist wing of the party has probably ever wielded. I, and, and, and we want to pick up on, on Steve Bannon, but we do have to take a commercial break, so we'll be back for final thoughts in just a moment. Some say this week will stand out in history. Our guests join us right now for final thoughts. And, and Christian, I wanted to start with you because you know Steve Bannon. Uh, you're close to uh, people who have worked with him. Uh, did you see this coming? Are, um, you know, do you think it reached the point that he had to leave the White House? Um, I see kind of two sides here. And, uh, you know, you have um, General Kelly comes in. And when you bring a new CEO on for any organization, I'm a big believer in empowering them, letting them pick their team. Um, it's important that they pick whoever's in whatever role. So I know there was disagreements with Bannon and Kelly. Um, but then on the other side, I also really enjoy, I mean, there's been some pictures of Bannon in his office, and he's got a whiteboard behind it, and he's got every one of Trump's campaign promises checked off if it's happened, not checked if it hasn't. And I just know from, you know, mutual contacts that Steve is a hard worker. Um, he fully believed in the president's agenda, and he had his head down, and he was always focused on it. That's why you didn't see him out in the media. You didn't see him on the news shows because he was focused on executing. Uh, Susan, for, for, uh, since the beginning of, of this administration and even during the, the campaign last summer, uh, Steve Bannon has been a boogeyman to, to mm -hmm. the Democrats. Oh, yeah. Uh, deservedly so or not, what does his departure mean for you? Does it mean a, a change in direction from the president himself? I think the influence of Bannon is definitely a change in direction because I, I agree he was really quiet and he kept out of the media but that doesn't mean his influence wasn't pretty powerful. I'm glad that he's gone for lots of reasons more than um, just uh, everything that he represents but also the fact that there needs to be some kind of structure in, in place whether I like the fact that Trump is president or not, there needs to be protocol and Kelly is, needs to be the person to do it. Um, you cannot have a focused administration on anything if it's like that. Uh, Jacob, at least on the Sun Coast, how, do you get the impression that people are paying attention to what is happening with these events every single day or are they just looking at the headlines and either they're interested or they're not? It's hard to say. I do think that in the political junkie world, uh, everybody knows all the personnel decisions that are happening in the White House. I think they're paying attention to the little moves. They have deep feelings about Steve Bannon, about Sean Spicer, about all the people who have come, about Kellyanne Conway, all the people who have stayed. I wonder how much that really matters and how much that translates into actual expectations in the electorate as a whole. All right, we will have to leave it there, but before we go, we want to talk about the story that we did last night, the impact of head injuries from the NFL to high school. According to a recent study, 110 out of 111 former NFL players found were found to have CTE, a degenerative brain disease. The NFL is having refs call penalties for helmet-to-helmet -helmet hits and fining players as well. There are new helmets coming out that provide more protection to players, and we asked you what you thought about kids playing football and what can be done to make the game safer. Matt says, many of my friends and I have permanent injuries from high school football. Not worth it unless you have a real chance at a scholarship. Maybe not even then. But RJ says, one phrase to parents that cry, grow a set. If your kids are playing football, he's tough enough to do so. And on the other side of the brain, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. RJ, I think the point of the scientific evidence is that it does kill you. You don't have to grow a set to understand that. If you'd like to join the conversation on tonight's topic, just visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash news at 7. And FYI, you can watch past discussions on demand. They're available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Roku. I want to thank all our guests for being here tonight. Christian Ziegler is Sarasota Republican State Committee man. Susan Nylon is with the Nylon Report. And we welcome Jacob Boggles, who is the senior editor of SRQ Magazine.